Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Louise Richardson. I'm the Vice Chancellor of the University of Oxford, and this is our Women Making History event. To commemorate the centenary of women matriculating and receiving degrees from Oxford, and to introduce the new Hillary Rodham Clinton Professor of Women's History, Brenda Stevenson. I am absolutely delighted to be joined by three extraordinary women this afternoon. Uh, Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton, who has lent her name to this chair. Uh, Professor Brenda Stevenson, who is the inaugural holder of the Hillary Rodham Clinton Chair in Women's History. As such, she will be a fellow in St. John's College. And we're also joined by um, Professor Maggie Snowling, President of St. John's College. If any of you have questions, I would invite you to put them in the um, Q&A function. Um, Maggie is going to be monitoring those and later uh, in the session she will be uh, putting your questions to the panelists. Um, this is a wonderful occasion to celebrate. Uh, this morning I walked sadly into an empty Sheldonian theatre dressed in all my robes and gave the traditional matriculation speech to our students. Uh, it was filmed and they will have to see it virtually. Uh, normally on Saturday, I would be uh, having these ceremonies in person with every incoming student coming and matriculating at the university. And it is a joyous occasion. But you can Im only imagine how joyous it must have been a hundred years ago. It was actually October 7th, 1920, when the first women were able to matriculate at Oxford. A week later, October 14th, uh, 1920, women were able to receive their degrees. Now I know women are fast learners, but they hadn't done all the work in that one week. There were many hundreds of women who had studied at Oxford over decades, had taken all the exams, done all the work, but had not been uh, permitted to get degrees until uh, 100 years ago yesterday. Uh, so you can only imagine what a joyous occasion that must have been. Um, and we're here to celebrate it. Um, we're here to look back, but also to look forward. And the purpose behind the Hillary Rodham Clinton chair is not only to investigate our past, to investigate the past of women, to write women back into history, but also to educate generations of, of young historians who will in turn continue to ensure that women are always, always have their rightful place in history. So uh, the choreography, as I said, I'm going to ask a few questions and then uh, we'll take your questions. Um, just to say a little about the history of women in Oxford, um, in 1878, the two first women's colleges were founded, Lady Margaret Hall, named for Lady Margaret Beaufort, and Somerville College, named for the mathematician Mary Somerville. Uh, even though Students, as I say, could come and could study. They weren't able to get degrees. But my favorite uh, aspect of this whole period, uh, partly, uh, no doubt entirely, because I'm a graduate of Trinity College Dublin, you may or may not know that Oxford only recognizes degrees from two other institutions, Cambridge University and Trinity College Dublin. So that when I was appointed vice chancellor, for example, the fact that I had a Trinity degree uh, meant I didn't have to have an Oxford one. Um, so in 1904, Trinity College Dublin admitted women uh, to get degrees from matriculation and to get degrees. And of course, the rule was that Oxford recognized Trinity degrees. So these highly educated enterprising women perceived a loophole and they traveled over to Dublin, to Trinity, to obtain degrees. These were, they were called the steamboat ladies. And in the course of the three year period uh, in 1908, uh, no, Trinity started graduating its own women, so decided they couldn't continue this process. So in those three years between 1904 and 1907, over 700 women, women from Oxford and Cambridge who had studied at Oxford and Cambridge, taken all the exams, met all the requirements for the degrees, traveled on a steamboat over to Trinity, where Trinity took their money, gave them a party, and gave them a degree. Uh, the enterprising provost of Trinity College at the time, Provost Trail, took their money and used it to build a, a hall of residence for Trinity women, 
safely three miles away from the main campus. And that is where I lived when I was a, a second year student in Trinity. So this idea of the steamboat ladies, and when one looks at the names of these women, they were extraordinary women who went on to, um, to lead many of the women's educational institutions in, in the UK in the 20th century. Um, but it shows how desperately they wanted the recognition for the work that they got. So they must have been absolutely thrilled to, uh, to receive it 100 years ago. I wonder what they think now if they looked at Oxford today, would they, uh, some no doubt would be delighted to see that more than half the undergraduates admitted are, are female. Um, no doubt they'd be a little disappointed that they had to wait another 100 years for a female VC, a little disappointed that there aren't more statutory professors who are women. Uh, we're making change, the trajectory is clear, but it is still slow. In any event, we're, we are today here to celebrate and to introduce you to two extraordinary women. And I am now going to ask them a few questions before turning it over to you. Um, Secretary Clinton, Professor Stevenson, um, if you could turn on your cameras. Um, I wonder if I could ask you um, to talk about the progress of women in the institutions you've participated in and what this this anniversary how, how it resonates with you may perhaps i could start with you secretary clinton well i'm delighted to be part of this uh, uh, wonderful event that is commemorating the hundred years of women uh, both matriculating and receiving degrees from oxford i went to a woman's college i went to wellesley college outside of boston uh, in part because having gone to a very large public comprehensive uh, high school in the United States of uh, thousands of uh, young, young men and women, um, I was seeking uh, an atmosphere in which I could be really challenged and nurtured uh, academically, and I found that at Wellesley. Um, so when I graduated from Wellesley, there was a, uh, a survey sent out asking alumni if they thought Wellesley should go co-educational. And I said at that time, I didn't think so because I thought there still needed to be uh, that kind of excellence in that kind of space for young women. Uh, fast forward, I think there's been an enormous amount of change in uh, academic institutions, uh, but I still believe that it probably is slower than, as you said, Louise, we would prefer. Uh, when I went to Yale Law School, I was um, a, one of a very small number of women in uh, the law school, although Yale Law School had taken women as students and given them degrees in the law uh, for decades before I showed up in 1969, uh, the university did not become co-ed until that year. And so, we just celebrated 50 years of co-education at Yale, and I am, you know, pleased to see a lot of the uh, the progress and change uh, that uh, universities, colleges, educational institutions of all uh, sizes uh, for all ages uh, have made in recognizing uh, the importance of women students, faculty, and administrators, and the importance of uh, really bringing women into the curriculum, but. Uh, Professor Stevenson has been on the forefront of a lot of uh, that work at UCLA. Thank you, Secretary Clinton. Professor Stevenson. Well, um, when I went off to college, actually, it was not just women who were just being admitted into the college at the University of Virginia, um, but also African Americans or people of color um, who were just being admitted too. So um, there, we were at an intersection uh, of people uh, coming to the college and changing it um, dramatically um, in the generation since then. And then I went off to Yale to graduate school. And um, by the time I got there, 
women's studies was actually um, growing um, um, at that university. There was a women's studies um, program and um, Nancy Cott was there. And it was really a wonderful introduction to women's history. So coming to UCLA actually was a great event for me because there were so many wonderful women, young women, who actually were invested in women's history. There was Ellen DeWois and Valerie Matsumoto and, you know, so many people in my department who, and we were known for that. We're kind of known for social history and women's history. But what I was particularly interested in was actually focusing um, also on women of color and particularly African-American women. And we've seen, you know, our inclusiveness, um, you know, and we've seen the embracing of those kinds of um, the studies of different kinds of women. And I'm very, very thankful um, that um, in being chosen for this position that Oxford and St. John's and the committee and the donors could actually see um, a black woman who focuses on women of color and black women in particular uh, in this very, very important role. So I'm very, very thankful um, that I've been allowed to do this. Thank you. We are thrilled that you've joined us. And um, let me just ask you a little about your personal histories. And um, Secretary Clinton, we've all watched as you have uh, grappled with, um, in many instances, being the, the, mo the foremost, most public woman in the United States and having to, uh, I suppose one of the few consolations, or one of the consolations for you must be that it would be easier for other women uh, after you because so many of the challenges you faced were a consequence of being the first woman and the discomfort of so many people around you. Uh, with having a woman in the roles that you occupied and so clearly uh, thrived and, and dominated. Um, what do you think, what insights, do you think there are unique insights that being a woman brought to your career? You know, Louise, I've given a lot of uh, thought, as you might guess, uh, to that question and all of its uh, <laughs> ramifications. Um, I, I wrote a book after uh, the 2016 campaign called What Happened, and I have a whole chapter uh, called Being a Woman in Politics, because I don't know that the, the struggles of uh, women in politics are, you know, qualitatively uh, different than the ongoing struggles of women in so many other aspects of uh, our life but it's played out in public. So we have a much clearer view of the double standard, of the uh, clash of uh, expectations about what's appropriate for women to do, to look like, uh, to be with respect to a family or uh, children. And I, I feel like I was uh, breaking new ground uh, in lots of the uh, steps that I took uh, in the last uh, decades to, you know, fulfill my own interests and my, uh, my own uh, uh, dreams uh, of what I was wanting to do, whether it was in the not-for-profit sort of public policy arena or in political life and, and public office. Um, I, would, I would just, you know, really point out that we're only beginning to be honest and transparent about the explicit and implicit biases uh, that we all carry, women and men, when it comes to judging women in public. Um, I think that's a good step forward. It's obviously a painful one to uh, see played out in the public arena, uh, in the media at, uh, in particular, but I think it's to the good, because unless we name and recognize sexism, racism, misogyny, other kinds of biases uh, that people still hold, despite even their efforts to overcome them in some cases, we're never going to really come to grips with the very historic, deep uh, biases against women in all kinds of roles in society. So. Yeah, I've been I've been on the front lines, uh, but I'm I'm really encouraged that we're being much more open and transparent 
uh, about this so that uh, we can we can have words to address it and it's not sort of under the radar influencing behavior uh, but never being pulled out to be examined. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Stevenson, you've had a very different career from Secretary Clinton, but how has your career been shaped by the fact that you're a woman, if at all? Well, I, uh, it's interesting, you know, I'm one of three daughters, and so um, I, I was raised in a very patriarchal household, and, um, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom, but um, she always, and my father as well, really believed in the potential of of myself and my and my sisters, and so um, that instilled in me um, a sense that I could do uh, anything. Well, could do a lot at any rate. Um, and particularly intellectually, they they thought of me as being somewhat intellectually gifted, and so it's. Um, I've been a female um, and uh, finding role models within my family as well as in um, my community um, has meant a great deal. I think it's been startling to people though, uh, lots of times when I show up. I think when I show up as a, a Black person, um, as a woman, um, people are taken aback. And I found that um, to happen, you know, in college and graduate school um, and, in, you know, um, at different positions that I've held um, throughout. Uh, but what I think I, de I derive a great deal of um, uh, comfort from the fact that there were other women like Secretary Clinton, for example, um, who were inspirational to me. And the women who also were doing the kinds of work that I did, you know, Darlene Clark Hine and Rosalind Turbrook Penn and, you know, so many other women who do the kinds of work and, and pioneered that kind of work uh, made it possible um, for me to believe that I could, you know, do the kind of work and find the subjects and and uncover their voices and, you know, I'm all I'm a social historian, so I'm always looking at, you know, the voices that we don't hear, the voices that are not. Um, prevalent, whether I'm looking at the Bible or whether I'm looking, you know, um, at a historical text or moment um, in time. So I think that being a woman has shaped, of course, my consciousness. I think knowing other women who do what I do, who sacrifice to do what I do, has shaped my consciousness. I think, you know, having a parental unit that, you know, believed in me and, and the wonderful mentors um, that I have had as an undergraduate, graduate, all the way through. I mean, that's, it, it's, if people say it takes a village, well, it takes a village of people who believe in women for women to, um, to, to move through up through the ranks and to explore the lives and experiences of women um, in a way that, you know, gains respect and inclusion. Thank you. Can we stick with women's history for a minute and ask me, let me ask you a few more questions about it, Brenda. What do you think is the importance of women's history for men as well as for women? Well, you know, um, it's a cliche, but it's true. We are half of the planet, and we have always been half of the planet. Um, so that, you know, everything that we see, our societies, our environment, our ecology, um, our political systems are all shaped um, in part by women, whether or not we are holding political offices, and we deserve to do so, um, or not, uh, whether we're voting or not. Um, and so, you know, to understand understand what the world is really about, um, to understand what we've gone through, to understand what we can accomplish in this world. We have to understand the place of women, the contributions of women, um, and of course, as, as Secretary Clinton said, the biases of women too. Uh, women, we have been excluded in many ways and we still are, but we are not innocents in the world. Uh, we contribute to the good as well as to the not so good in our society. And so we have to understand this. We have to uh, embrace it in order to change it, to make the world better. So I think it's very important for everyone to understand uh, what women have contributed, what influences we have had. I mean, we raised the men who we see are, you know, um, um, doing things in the world that we would like to correct, that we'd like to at least help to evolve. Um, and so um, I think. I think women's history is, is, is fundamentally uh, important to us understanding where we are um, as a people, 
um, as a world, as a nation, um, particularly in this moment of, you know, difficult with regard to our climate, to the ways in which we treat one another, um, to race and gender. Um, and we have ways to go. I mean, women are still um, not receiving the same amount of money for their work or income for their work as men are. Um, women are much more likely to be impoverished. Um, women are much more likely to be abused um, in the domestic environment. Women are much more likely to be trafficked when we look at slavery um, today. And women are much more likely not to be elected um, to national offices. And so there, and there's so much more um, too. So we have to understand the put great potential of women, um, particularly in um, the evolution of our society. I was very, very very happy, of course, to see the Nobel Prizes um, this year, where we had women who were receiving Nobel Prizes in the sciences, as well as in the arts, um, too. Um, we do magnificent things in the world. People need to understand that, to be inspired by that, so that you know, the next generations can continue to, to do more and to do better for our society. Thank you. Well, we were very proud that two of the women who won Nobel Prizes, Jennifer Dudner and Andrea Goetz, we had given them honorary degrees last year. So um, we were pleased. Um, but can I ask you what led you to history as an academic study? What, do you, what is it that makes you love history? As a well, to I grew up in Virginia. Oh, <laughs> I grew up in the, in the southern eastern part of Virginia, which is steeped in history. It didn't seem like we could go anywhere, turn any corner, um, read any book that wasn't focused on, particularly in the colonial period. And so, um, you know, I grew up very close to Jamestown and Williamsburg and Yorktown. I I went to the University of Virginia, which is steeped in history um, as well. My mother was the first historian um, that I knew, and she gave me all the stories of my family, our, our enslavement, our movement um, through that um, terrible period of history, um, etc. So I was drawn to that. Going to college thinking I I was going to be a physician. And I say this to all of you all out there, you all, many of you will know um, the burden of organic chemistry. Well, <laughs> thanks to organic chemistry. <laughs> I'm a historian, um, and so I was very much encouraged um, to pursue history as an undergraduate at the University of Virginia, and certainly the Yale History Department is magnificent, and it was when I was there. My mentor, John Blastingame, Nancy Cott, all of these people really encouraged my interest, but I was always drawn by, to, to look at what I wasn't seeing to find out what was not there. The stories that my mother told me about the women in my family were not the stories that I was reading about women um, in the history. The people um, who I was learning about were not those people. So I was drawn to that. I knew that history could be inspirational. It could be something that would help us to evolve as a people. And I was particularly interested in trying to uncover that and bring those voices voices um, to the world. So I was very blessed in that way. Let me ask you one more question about your work. It's unusual in that it is a combination of analytical rigor and deep empathy. That combination doesn't often go together. How do you, how do you manage that? Well, I think my deep empathy comes from uh, my background as a moral person and as a religious person, um, too, when we are, you know, um, asked to really see everyone as an equal um, in society with equal potential. Um, but I also think that I am so um, aware of the lack of voices the introduction of voices of people um, who have lived through historical experiences, that I want to make certain that I tell the story of an event from all different perspectives. Um, and I want my students to be able to hear those different perspectives, to try to understand them, uh, not to judge them outright. Of course, we all judge. Okay, we, we can't help it. We're very judgmental in the way we approach historical figures. But I want people to at least to understand where this person might be coming from. 
um, how they may have gotten to this particular um, consciousness and behaved um, in this particular kind of way. And I also deeply believe in the individual's intellect. That is the ability of a person to figure it out for themselves. If we give them enough information, if we provide enough context, I don't want to lead them to a conclusion. I want them to come to that. I want them to grow intellectually to get to that point. Um, and so I don't want to beat them over the head with my perspective, not in my classroom and not in my writing. Um, I want them to be able to see what is there for themselves as they evolve as a person and intellectually and as a moral person um, as well. I can't wait to have you in our classroom. <laughs> Thank you. Can't well, wait to be there. <laughs> but you can, let's broaden this out. Uh, you're not a historian and yet women's stories are some clearly very important to you. What, um, what does history mean for you and what have you learned from history do you think? Well, I really resonate to what Brenda was saying because uh, for me, it, it is very much about lifting up voices of people who would otherwise not be heard, not be seen, uh, be overlooked. Uh, and it's, it's difficult to do in a political uh, context uh, because very often, uh, in politics, you go to where the loudest voices are, uh, where the most uh, active uh, people in society because of their positions that they hold or, you know, the kind of uh, uh, stands that they take uh, on controversial uh, issues. So those voices really do overwhelm often uh, so many others. You know, just take an example that we're living through right now. Uh, this pandemic uh, has fallen disproportionately, not only in the United States, but around the world, on women and girls. Um, in our country, frontline essential workers are predominantly women. Healthcare workers are women. Uh, people who have been uh, laid off or lost their jobs are disproportionately women. Women are facing really hard choices about going back to work if they can. Uh, because there's no childcare open, there's no school uh, that is uh, physical in many parts of our country. So the burdens that uh, women are enduring right now is a perfect example of how those stories should be lifted up and told and should influence uh, policies, decision makers, but very often they're lost in the, you know, the back and forth of a political campaign or the, you know, kind of um, sensational coverage of uh, what's happening with uh, uh, the disease as it um, resurges in parts of the United States. So I think that in, in my public life, I've always tried to figure out how to be a voice for uh, those who might not otherwise uh, have one that could be heard. You know, as, as Brenda said, they know what's happening in their own lives. They could talk about it very convincingly and, and I think passionately if someone would give them the forum to do so, yet very often that doesn't happen. So then people like myself as a senator or secretary of state or a candidate, um, I believe should bear that responsibility. Um, the other thing that's going to be fascinating historically is to look back at this pandemic, hopefully look back sooner than later, and to try to understand why countries led by women have generally done better in dealing with the pandemic. You know, women are not all alike, whether they're presidents or prime ministers. You know, we all have our different experiences and our own values and the like that we bring to uh, our uh, governing, but why is it that New Zealand or Taiwan or Germany or Finland or Denmark, and there are several others, have actually done better in terms of loss of life, uh, less impact on the economy, uh, and uh, generally just navigated through this with more uh, inclusivity, empathy, attention to science, uh, I think that's going to be a fascinating uh, case study as to what were the common traits uh, that uh, led to this kind of an outcome. You must have a hypothesis, do you, as to why? I do. Well, I know some of the women, obviously, uh, the 
prime minister of New Zealand, the chancellor of Germany. They're very smart. They're empathetic. They're good listeners. Um, and they are willing to be guided by expert advice, often at the cost of short-term uh, political disadvantage. Uh, when uh, Prime Minister uh, Ardern of New Zealand shut down the country, you know, that was very controversial. But she communicated continuously. She brought the population into her decision-making. The same with Chancellor Merkel. So. I think there are common leadership characteristics, whether or not they're rooted in the experiences that um, they had as women becoming leaders is something that I think would be fascinating to unpack. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What do you think about this, Brenda? Um, well, I, I, I certainly agree with the secretary. She is a fount of knowledge and experience with regard to female leadership on the, in the planet. And I appreciate it. And I just want to take this moment to say how proud I am to have a chair that has her name associated with it. She has been an inspiration for me for, for decades. And, and so I just want to say that um, to the audience. Um, I am the person who looks at the other women, though. I'm the person who looks at, as she said, the, um, the, the, the people on the front line. So uh, in the future, I'm also hoping that people will be studying you know, those women and the kinds of impact that it's had on their lives and the kinds of impact they had on people who were in the hospitals or who were who needed the kind of care and attention those persons who who came in to help the family when a loved one had passed away um, etc and so um, and I'm also very interested I suppose in what's happening um, with um, poor women um, during this time period um, and women of color um, during this time period as we see um, um, those communities are disproportionately impacted um, by COVID. And so what's happening in the United States, for example, in Latinx um, families, Latinx families, and what's happening in Black families and poor white families um, as well, and how these women are pushing you know, forward. These are the women, for example, who are um, not, uh, who have to stay home with their children, as Secretary Clinton said, but who also are losing their jobs. Um, in a society where you know many children are living in female uh, female headed households, and so you know when their mothers leaves their jobs. Um, what happens to those children? Um, these are the women. What happens to the homeless people doing these kinds of, of problems too? So I'm always excited about the possibility of what history can do to help us um, to better get through um, these kinds of crises within our societies. And now that we're seeing this kind of convergence of crises together, the place of women and how this impacts women um, at this point of convergence, uh, and borrowing that from you, Steve, um, is very, very important. Thank you. And so then you, you both think history has contributed significantly to public life then as a, you've made a powerful case as to why it matters politically as a, really as a formation for citizens. Um, is, it, is that why you're both so committed to history, you think? Well, I, I certainly am. You know, I think, I think uh, Brenda said earlier uh, that the failure to understand history um, has, in my view, become even more uh, concerning. I don't know whether we're not teaching history effectively. I don't know whether the attention span that people have with social media and, and the, the immediacy uh, of the present, uh, the sensationalism of uh, you know, trying to figure out you know, what's happening right now has really blotted out uh, the space for people to pay more attention to and learn the lessons of history. You know, I've thought so often of 
the pandemic that we had in the world 100 years ago, about the time that women were uh, matriculating and getting uh, degrees, we had a terrible influenza, unfairly called the Spanish flu. Uh, but it's estimated 50 million people died across the world. Uh, about 650,000 died in the United States. And guess what? They went through some of the very same uh, decision-making challenges that face us today. Some cities locked down and then under political and public pressure opened up again. Other cities stayed locked down. You can compare the loss of life in, for example, St. Louis to Philadelphia a hundred years ago uh, during this uh, pandemic. And you can see that St. Louis stayed locked down, that the public health officials were adamant they were not going to give in to political pressure. Philadelphia was, you know, really under enormous pressure. And so they went ahead with an annual parade that they had in the city and the, you know, the sickness and death rate went up. Why hasn't that been at the center of the decision making in our national governments, our state governments in the United States? It's not like you can ignore the fact that it happened and that there are lessons to be learned, but for whatever combination of reasons, uh, it, it's been you know, largely overlooked. Um, an article here or there, you know, a comment, but nothing like what we should learn from it. So I think the teaching of an understanding of history in such a polarized time as we are going through, uh, certainly in the United States, but I think more broadly, uh, is absolutely critical. And the final thing I would say is, you know, the fate of democracy in many ways rests on people understanding what the pressures were that brought down democracies in the past, what the authoritarian leader did in order to uh, have an election and then never leave uh, and then impose his, uh, you know, his political uh, and personal will on populations. So there's so much we need to be learning and you just add in the huge uh, vacuum that exists in so many areas when it comes to women's history. This could not be more timely. Thank you. On that point, I can't resist pointing out that um, in the 17th century, Oxford uh, suffered from several plagues. Um, and in fact, um, as did London, like the parliament moved from London to Oxford and met in Convocation House, which is about 50 yards from my office um, uh, to avoid the plague. Um, but many of the same debates took place. The townspeople were very nervous of the university as the students as a place for, as a cause of spreading or bringing disease into the town. People practiced social distancing. They realized that that was the key to preventing good hygiene and social distancing. Well, they realized in the 17th century were the best antidote. Uh, the two things, the only two things I can find that they did differently then was that they, uh, they didn't close down houses of worship, uh, which have been closed uh, this time. Um, and secondly, they blamed pets. So they, um, they killed cats and dogs in large numbers, which thankfully we haven't done. But again, uh, the fact that uh, plagues have, have occurred throughout our history, not to mention the fact that uh, We've had eight near misses of, in pandemics since the year 2000, and yet we managed to be unprepared this time. Um, is quite extraordinary. Um, but let me ask a different question. Do you think that history today still, do you think we still address the questions that, that young women think are important? What do you think, Brenda? Oh, I think that we're just growing in terms of the kinds of questions that we ask and that, you know, young women are at the center of the kinds of events and experiences that we want to focus on. I mean, there's been a really large push in looking at childhood studies and girls studies, for example, um, girls during the adolescence period over across, across time and across place. And I also think that young women uh, today are particularly interested in being 
being socially conscious, particularly interested in inclusion and equality. Um, and as the, as the secretary says, in democra um, democratic process and practice. And so um, one of the things I think that we also, that we have to really embrace and we are embracing is the kind of inequalities that we see across time and place that keep playing out over and over and over again, just like our inadequate responses to plagues, for example. Um, you know, at the time of the, of the 1918 um, 19, uh, event, uh, of course, there were lots of race riots um, very soon thereafter. And you imagine, and even today when we're having COVID and we're seeing, you know, this rash of police killings and shootings and unrest uh, within our society, and I raise the name of Breonna Taylor because I'm thinking about women, particularly right now, um, that this continues to occur during this time period. And so the, the lessons of history have to be learned and they have to be addressed um, in a way uh, that makes women more equitably treated within our society and um, all kinds of women um, too. And so I do think that we are addressing the issues that women are particularly interested in when we're looking at the democratic process, when we're looking at women, at women in the political um, arena, when we're looking at women in the economy, me, uh, when we're looking at the ways in which women have been treated within the household, have been thought of, um, the ways in which women have been used as enslaved peoples and populate and, and the people who have um, people who are enslaved. So, you know, historians are reaching out to try to really inform um, and use that information as a way that policymakers can therefore address these recurring and long-term um, social inequities, um, political inequities, economic inequities, and even cultural inequities within our society. Thank you. So let's bring this back then, a little closer to home, to this chair. And let me ask you, Secretary Clinton, what captured your imagination about the idea of a chair of women's history at Oxford of all places? Well, I was so struck by the idea that Oxford, with its long and storied history, and with its first woman vice chancellor, uh, because you and I had known each other before uh, you were uh, given uh, that uh, title, uh, just seemed like the perfect place at the perfect time uh, to lift up uh, this idea that women's history has to be treated not as a side issue, um, as an ancillary course, but centered in the curriculum, centered in our understanding of history, how we learn it, uh, how we practice it. Uh, and it was thrilling to me that Oxford would entertain uh, having such a chair, the first in the world, as far as we know. Um, and then I was incredibly humbled and, and delighted to be asked if I would lend my name to uh, the chair. Uh, so it, it just was uh, serendipitous, uh, Louise. It, it could not have come at a better time when I was thinking even more uh, deeply about some of my experiences running for president, some of the challenges that I saw uh, more broadly for uh, women that, as, as uh, Professor Stevenson just said, just keep being recycled and repeated. Uh, sometimes you feel as though it's one step forward, a half or two steps backward. We keep going through the same arguments, the same kinds of debates, uh, that we should have a deeper understanding of why that happens and then apply those lessons of history to uh, the present and the future. And I was so pleased to hear Brenda talk about how young women are especially interested in a lot of the you know, persistent inequities that uh, uh, we live with now that uh, certainly have been part of history as well. Thank you. And Brenda, we know it wasn't the weather, the climate that attracted you to Oxford. You were in a very well established in California. What a uh, how did we manage, I'm very glad we did, but how did we manage to persuade you? What was it about this chair and Oxford that attracted you to um, pick up your, your life, your family and move over here? 
Well, um, I, I hope to move over as soon as COVID will allow me to do so, first of all. But secondly, I think that uh, it would, it, it just seemed um, an enormous opportunity, um, the rarest of opportunities and the most blessed of them to be able to come to a place um, such as Oxford, as Secretary Clinton said, it's historical, it's storied, um, it is so well respected globally. It's been such an intellectual leader um, for um, centuries. Um, and to take up this new post in women's history, um, to have a chair that is named for one of the most iconic women um, in the history of the world and certainly during our time period and someone who I admire so much. Um, and I also just believe that I'm extremely proud and feel particularly blessed that uh, you know, that I was chosen, um, a Black woman who, you know, focuses a lot of attention on um, women that are often invisible, on Black women and women from poor women from the past and, you know, in present day society. And, um, and so, you know, um, I'm just very thankful and pleased um, to have been chosen. Um, it's very nice to be chosen always. And uh, it's also very nice to think that people um, will invest in what you've invested in, um, that people will listen very carefully and read very carefully the kind of work that you've dedicated your life to and the kind of subject matter and say, that's what we want um, at our university. And so um, it was really not possible for me to say no. Um, and, and happily so, and happily so. Well, we're very glad. Well, I think we should open out at this point to, uh, to the audience. We have um, Professor Maggie Snowling, who is the president of St. John's College, has been um, monitoring the questions coming in. I should explain that the enthusiasm for this chair is so broad that um, when there is a new statutory professorship, we invite colleges to bid so, to, so that the occupant of that professorship can be a fellow at that college. Well, we had an enormous problem this time because no less than 19 colleges bid for um, uh, to be the host of this chair. And uh, many made very powerful and compelling arguments uh, as to why the chair should be at their college. So it gives, uh, just gives a sense of the enormous enthusiasm for, for you, Brenda, and for this chair and all it represents all across the university. Ultimately, we, we, we selected St. John's uh, for a whole range of reasons. Um, and uh, we're delighted that Maggie is here today. Maggie is a, a, an expert on dyslexia and a, a distinguished academic and has been uh, president of St. John's for uh, since 2012. So, um, Maggie, let me turn it over to you and, and um, see what you find from questions from the audience. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. And, and first of all, might I just say how honored St. John's College is to um, be associated with the uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton Chair. Um, it is an incredibly prestigious chair and uh, we are actually quite a modest college, but I think really our pride is, is, is absolutely you know, immense. Um, also very, very um, pleased to be welcoming Professor Stevenson uh, to our college. She will be actually the fifth professor, female professorial fellow at St. John's. And um, I, I think we, we very much look forward to July when you join us um, post-COVID. I've been uh, sitting here monitoring um, a host of really interesting questions uh, far too many than could possibly be, be asked. And of course, as, as all incredible panelists um, would, uh, would be, uh, they have touched on answers to many, many of the questions. So I'm going to just um, be fairly brief. I'm going to ask both panelists and also our Vice Chancellor one fairly general question um, just to, uh, to, uh, to select from those that, that I've been um, Sent. Um, so first of all, um, Brenda, perhaps um, I could uh, say that um, we've, we've spent a lot of time together now reflecting on history and how history can inform progress in the future, which is really important. 
I think we should now be thinking about the future. So what is the hope for the legacy of the Hillary Rodham Clinton chair at Oxford? And particularly, what is your hope for your legacy? Thank you very much. And thank you, President Al Snowling. And I'm looking forward to being a part of St. John's College. Um, well, I do think what I hope for the legacy of the chair um, well, that first of all, it will encourage other universities um, to endow chairs that are specifically focused on women's history. Um, so Oxford and St. John's have always been intellectual leaders, um, particularly distinguished um, and respected. And so my first hope is that um, other chairs in women's history will be established um, globally and, and major, major and, and not so major uh, universities. Uh, secondarily, I would hope that the chair would encourage um, more and more research on women, um, women from that we don't typically um, look at, um, that we don't typically think about from various cultures and societies, um, women um, in the past and um, in, in the far past, but also um, in the more recent past, that we will um, look at their, uh, their lives within their homes and within their societies and within their cultures, um, that we will um, also encourage scholars who are females, um, to become involved and invested in um, intellectual and research um, pursuits, um, young students, young girls. I have lots of, um, of women who write to me um, who ask about becoming an academic and, you know, pursuing um, intellectual um, topics and ideas. I'm hoping that the chair will also encourage um, that kind of legacy. I'm hoping that the chair also will uh, encourage public history. Um, that will encourage people not only in, you know, ivy color, uh, ivy covered buildings, um, but um, also people who are on street, that people will go into museums, that people will invest in museums and um, markers and monuments um, um, that deal with women and our presence um, in the world across time and place. So I'm really hoping that the chair will invest tremendously um, in public history um, in um, Britain, but also um, throughout the world and that we will enlighten, you know, through public history, because it's not just, you know, scholars talking to one another or scholars talking to the students or mentoring, you know, who are going to be important intellectuals, but it's the people um, who live in our society, um, no matter what your class or occupation or race or ethnicity, who need to know this history, um, who need to see themselves reflected in the history that we tell. That's really going to change the way in which we think about our place in the world and how the world can evolve to be a better place. So these are the kinds of things that I'm hoping um, that the chair will be able to do, the kind of legacy um, that it will have. And I think that's appropriate given that the secretary whom the chair is named for has has been so um, impactful uh, in all sectors of society, not just among the wealthy or the esteemed, um, not just in the United States, but globally and in all kinds of ways, diplomatically um, and with different classes and, and kinds of people. So um, I, it's a big order, but I think the cheer calls for that. I think it calls for having a great impact um, at St. John's, at Oxford, in Britain, but also globally. Thank you very much. And, and please be, be assured that in Oxford, you will be able to reach out well beyond history to other disciplines, to culture, the arts, and indeed uh, museums. We look forward to welcoming you. Secretary Clinton, um, we've reflected on uh, the importance of women in global leadership at the present time and in the past. Um, a question about the future. What advice do you have for men supporting women in leadership? Please do. <laughs> I think that would be my, my first response. Um, you know, I've been uh, supported, mentored, uh, encouraged by so many men. 
uh, in the course of my career. Uh, and it makes a real difference. Uh, it makes a difference uh, to have that kind of recognition of your um, worthiness, your, your standing and leadership. I think many, many people were shocked uh, when then President-elect Obama asked me after a, a hard fought primary campaign uh, to be his Secretary of State. And it, it sent a message uh, to, you know, not just our own country, but the world that uh, there can be uh, higher and more significant uh, relationships and, and, and partnerships uh, than you, you might see on the surface with a, a political back and forth. Uh, so I hope that uh, more men will uh, study uh, women's history, uh, be interested in uh, participating, <clears throat> as Professor Stevenson just said, in all the many ways that history can be manifest in the public uh, uh, space, and will mentor and support uh, women, particularly young women, uh, who wish to enter the, the public arena uh, as government officials, as political candidates, uh, because it, it really should be a joint uh, effort or commitment uh, from men and women to lift up uh, women's leadership and particularly to you know, pave the way and, and create and fill the pipeline for young women. Thank you very much indeed for those wise words. So Louise, Vice Chancellor, first of all, can I, I think, thank you on behalf of us all for having the idea of this women's history chair, um, the first chair, as far as we know, uh, of, of, of this nature, um, certainly in Europe and probably anywhere in the world. So thank you very much for the idea and for, for seeing it through. Um, the question for you is, what do you hope for the next 100 years for women in higher education and in academia? Ah. Well, I really hope that our daughters will never have to be the first female anything. <laughs> I re really look forward to the day when a woman can compete with another woman uh, to be president of the United States, to be chancellor of Germany, to be prime minister of the UK, without anybody remarking on the fact that they're women, not to mention not remarking the, on their clothes and appearance and the rest of it. Um, Yeah, I, I often wonder what the women, as I, as I mentioned, you know, there, there were some extraordinary female academics in the early 18th century, women like Lara Bassi or, the, or Maria Ignacy, the, the mathematician. And, you know, 300 years ago, there were women at the pinnacle of academic life. And I think if they were to look 300 years forward, they would be stunned that we haven't made more progress. And yet, you know, the pace is slow, but the trajectory is clear. I hope we can accelerate the pace of change a bit. Um, and I hope that other movements for social change uh, will uh, accelerate. They won't have the slow, relatively slow pace of change that women acquiring equality have had. So, um, you know, there's many movements. There's, there's so much injustice in the world still, so much inequity along racial lines, socioeconomic lines, region lines, and so on, regional lines. Um, let's hope that we can pick up the pace of change, uh, but bring society with us as we do that. Uh, but 100 years from now, I think uh, the gender, somebody's gender should be uh, completely immaterial in any evaluation of their, of, of, uh, their academic uh, work or indeed their worth as an individual. Uh, and I hope we get there in shorter than 100 years too. Thank you. And um, I think we have run out of time. I, I would just like to say that um, this event, while um, is designed to introduce you to our, our wonderful new chair and to thank the extraordinary woman who has inspired us all, who has lent it uh, her name. Uh, it's also uh, to launch the celebration of the centenary of the matriculation uh, of women. Um, of course, we had very different plans. Uh, we had plans for several conferences uh, this week, several in-person events this week to kick off these celebrations. 
The celebrations will be joyous regardless. They may be slightly less noisy than originally planned because many of them necessarily will be virtual. Uh, but we will continue to celebrate throughout the course of this year. We have just yesterday launched a, a website um, and there will be uh, many academic talks and we hope come Trinity term um, major gatherings in which we hope we will be able to bring Secretary Clinton back and uh, Professor Stevenson back and, and many other um, extraordinary graduates of this university who are all over the world who are in who are changing the world and making it a better place and of whom we are enormously proud. Uh, so we will continue to celebrate for the whole year. In this time of pandemic, um, it's good to have some cause for celebration, and we certainly do. And the fact that we have so many uh, remarkable women to celebrate and this, be able to celebrate the things that they have done, uh, this will keep us celebrating for the, for the year ahead. So let me thank all of you for tuning in. Thank um, Professor Snowling for, for um, managing all your questions. Uh, thank Professor, uh, um, Professor Brenda Stevenson for agreeing to come and be introduced in this somewhat unusual way uh, to the Oxford community. But I hope even though you're not um, seeing people in the flesh, you're just getting some sense of the enthusiasm uh, and the warmth of the welcome that awaits you here. And again, uh, thank you, Secretary Clinton, for so resolutely finding, fighting the good fight and for lending your name to this chair. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And you'll be hearing more about the, the celebrations to come. Thank you. Thank you all.